Okay. Well, we have a full house, and uh, welcome everybody. And I would especially like to welcome, and I'm really, really happy to be able to welcome and introduce Jean Trin, who is um, the only Vietnamese American ever to uh, be launched into space and return. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this was uh, now actually just by way of a little bit of uh, of interest. You are not, however, the first Vietnamese person to go to space, are you? No. Who was that? I was a fellow uh, was in the North Vietnamese Air Force uh, and uh, went up uh, in the days of the Soviet Union. Uh, so the uh, Russians sent him up there for a little trip. And he actually was uh, a trained astronaut, right? Well, he was you, a trained pilot. A pi trained pilot, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you are primarily a scientist uh, who went up because of your scientific research. That's exactly right. I'm not a professional astronaut. I'm more a professional scientist that got very lucky and got a seat on the, on the space shuttle. Just barely, because you were number seven. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, uh, tell us a little bit about this. This is a patch, and as I recall, all of the uh, every mission had its own patch with the names of the astronauts on it. And uh, so, did you wear this while you were out in space? Uh, no, we don't wear the patch when oh. we're in space. It, uh, when you're actually in space. You wear regular clothes. That's what you have now. Pretty uh -huh. much, if you wanted to, uh, little t-shirts and things like that, shirt sleeve. So it's it's a very nice environment. It's pressurized, and uh, you don't have to wear any uniform, except in the days where you have to take pictures. You know. And we have a few of those. Okay. Actually, I think this one was done before the launch, right? That's right. Uh, all right. So this picture is uh, taken at uh, Palmdale. Palmdale up uh, uh, north here on the 405 freeway is a place where the process basically service the space shuttle. So the Columbia space shuttle, which was the ship I used, uh, was in, back in 1992, seems like a long time ago, was actually being repaired and refurbished at Palmdale. And you can see there that uh, we had a crew of seven, and we usually go there before they finished the refurbishment to kind of uh, thank the technicians and the people who actually work on the ship. Now this was in 19, or yeah, 2000, no, 1994, right? 1994. No, the, the flight was 1994, but I think this picture was taken in 1991. 1991. And uh, do you remember who, can you name who the others are? Oh, absolutely, but it was last century, remember, that's a long time yeah. ago. So, okay. on, on, on the very... Your left. Your left. It's uh, Dr. Ellen Baker. She's a, she's a medical doctor and a mission specialist. Mission specialists are uh, professional astronauts that are basically based in uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. The second fellow next to her is uh, uh, Commander Bar Sox, Ken Barasox. Okay. Uh, who now has worked uh, way up placed in, uh, in private industry, uh, building rockets to go to the moon. Uh, the third person is uh, Dr. Uh, Bonnie Dunbar. She was uh, the payload commander. The payload commander is the one who is in charge of the payload. The payload is whatever the shuttle carries at the time during the mission to carry out what the mission was. In the middle, right in the middle, is uh, Commander Richards, Dick Richards, Richard Richard Richards, so RR, is a great commander. Uh, that, uh, the one is, uh, gosh, is my best friend. <laughs> you remember his name? That, that happens when you get older, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. Oh dear. Okay, oh, welcome back to him. Yeah, that, that one. I Who's this one? This one, I don't remember him at all. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that one is Gene. That's right. Uh, and, and this one is uh, the other payload specialist. Uh, and by the way, payload specialists are kind of scientist astronauts. They're not the professional astronauts. 
the Canada ones who are selected on specific flight to carry out specific scientific uh, duties. And his name is uh, Larry De Lucas. He's, he's an optometrist at the University of Alabama. Okay. Oh, now I know. Uh, the, the fellow yeah. that I remember is uh, called Carl. Carl Mead. Car Carl Mead. Carl Mead. Okay. Yes, he's a colonel of the Air Force, a, a test pilot, and uh, one of those uh, veterans from, uh, from the Air Force. Okay, Mickey, right, there he is. Okay, well, let's go on. This, I think, is a picture of it being taken to, probably in Florida, being taken to the uh, launch site. I believe that uh, after they delivered uh, uh, from uh, Palmdale, let it get processed on the big big Boeing 747, and they take it down. Mm -hmm. They have to carry it to the, to the vertical assembly building uh, in order to have made it with the rockets. Yeah. I got all of these pictures, by the way, on websites uh, de 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 dedicated to STS-50, which is the flight that, uh, that you were on, Gene. Right. So uh, this presumably is not just a generic picture, but it is the Columbia. You can see the name there. And uh, it is for STS-50. What does STS stand for? STS stands for Space Transportation System. It's, uh, it's like they used to be the Uber of uh, space work. Uh, the, the, the space shuttle program spanned uh, from 1980 to 2011. So they, they had uh, quite a long time, a 30 year span, where they had 126 flights. And your ship, Columbia, uh, this was its, what, 12th mission, uh, I, I believe? I believe so, yes. Uh, and it, it was, uh, its inaugural flight was in 19, about the lights, I can't read it, 1981? That's 1981, that's the first flight. This is the oldest space shuttle. Uh, of course, you can't really say that's the oldest anything because the space shuttles are, I'm sorry. <laughs> nice jazzy ringtone. Well, it's a potential spam. <laughs> you just won a million dollars. Yes, right. And that, uh, you have to send them 500,000 first. Right, of course. Let me turn <laughs> down the sound here. So it doesn't disturb me anymore. There we go. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, one of the interesting things you can see on there are the, are the tiles for the heat protection. Um, I don't know if you all can see them, but they're kind of clear when you're up this close. They look kind of ugly, actually, but they keep you alive. Now, the, the space shuttle is, uh, as it says, a shuttle. So it uh, goes up and down. And it's uh, the first generation ever, and I don't think they will ever build another one, that is a re reusable spacecraft. You actually go up and you go back down with it. And uh, the going up is... Oh, well, it could be tricky, but it's not as hard as the going down. Uh, the hard part in uh, getting back to Earth when you're at, out in space is you have to hit the atmosphere. As you know, the atmosphere is full of air. <laughs> and when you go at very high speed, uh, things get very hot. So if you have something that's not protected by insulation, in this case, the tiles, uh, the insulation, they're very thick tiles this thick, about five inches, and they're made out of ceramics. And so the bottom part of the shuttle is insulated with those tiles in order to protect it from the heat. If there is a break, a little hole in those tiles, the aluminum framework will pretty much melt under the heat of re-entry because it's going so fast and the friction heats up uh, and it will melt the aluminum, which has disastrous, and it had been. Uh, that has happened. And that is what happened to the Columbia on its, what was it, 27th mission, I think. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Columbia had uh, issues. And actually what happened, uh, and it was discovered by one of the panel members of the review panels after the accident, is that one of the tiles at the wing, on the side of the wing, you can see was damaged during ascent, during the launch. So it turned out that some of the tiles in the front had fallen on the tiles on the back and uh, kind of denuded and uh, took away the protection. And uh, as you went down, things happened that were very bad. Not very good, sadly. Uh, who's that? Okay, now, 
this is a pretty snazzy suit, and it costs quite a bit of money. Uh, but it's only used in the space shuttle program for launch and entry, which is basically when you go up and when you go down. Uh, it essentially weighs about 50 to 60 pounds. It has a parachute with it. It has a boat. It has a little bit of food. It's just, just about everything you want for a camping trip if you wanted to. And the helmet, uh, when you bring down the visor, is completely sealed. The suit is completely sealed, so uh, you can actually breathe oxygen in there, which you carry in a bottle next to you. It's designed uh, in case of accident during launch. Uh, there's a capability for the crew to get out of the shuttle, uh, assuming you have enough time, and parachute out. So that suit allows you to parachute out at very high altitude, and at the same time, uh, as you hit the ocean, or you hit the ground, uh, the parachute will, of course, save you. If you're in the, in the ocean, then you have that little inflatable boat to float for a while. Now, this suit was specially made, tailored for you. It's made to tailored for each of the individual astronauts, yes? No, no, no. The suit, no? Uh, basically, uh, you know, you have a certain size range. For I see. They get them off the rack. Excellent. And, that's <laughs> okay. and actually, uh, yes. So you didn't get to keep yours afterwards? Not that guy, no, no. <laughs> you get to keep the blue suit that you go oh. around with. Okay. But not this one. Okay. This is your seating arrangement, um, and you were number seven. You see Trin up there, number seven, and that means you were down below in a seat that did not have a view. No, the, the seat, that, well, it depends what you do call a view. I had a very <laughs> nice view of a bunch of lockers, but you don't have a view outside the window. The only windows are on the top uh, in the flight deck. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the thing is, as you, you, you well know, when you launch a rocket or a space shuttle, it's always vertical. So if you look out the window, you basically see the sky. This is where you want to go, destination. Uh, you can also see a little bit on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, but the mid-deck, uh, the only advantage of the mid-deck is that you get a bathroom. Ah. Very important, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't get up to go while your seat belts are fast. Well, I mean, you can get up to go, but I don't know you where we <laughs> Okay. Um, so there you are, right up there at the launch. That's right. And, uh, the, the space shuttle has uh, basically a set of six rockets. It has three, uh, five rockets, I'm sorry. It has three main engines on the shuttle itself and two large solid rockets. You can see those two white. And those are the big rockets. The, the big ones. That yeah. You see. yeah, and those are the ones who mostly supply the thrust. Uh, and those are the ones who make the biggest noise. But they get jettisoned after they get finished. Same thing. Mm -hmm. The big orange thing is a tank. It's just oxygen, hydrogen tank. Right, and that is to fuel the rockets on board the space shuttle. That's right. While it's still going up. That's correct. Yes. So and then it gets, it gets jettisoned. When you're in orbit or before you get to orbit? Uh, just before you get to orbit. Uh -huh. Now, the, the, and, and you can see that uh, the big major components are just either fuel tank or rockets. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the hardest part of a, of a spacecraft is really to get off the, lock, the Earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gravity kind of really make, make you pay a lot of uh, penalty. It gives you a good penalty for getting off. Mm -hmm. And how far up did you get off? Well, generally, a uh, space shuttle orbit uh, goes into a high latitude of about uh, the 20 degrees north south, or 57 degrees. But generally, it varies between 200, 200 and 150 miles. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, not too far, but <coughs> far enough. Now, this is what this is one thing you had to get dressed up for. That's right, uh, and you can see that there are people in red and people in blue. And uh, this picture actually was taken on Fourth of July. We were uh, on orbit during the 4th of July of that year. Right, and one of the distinctions you had was that you were in space for the longest period of time up to that time. Almost 14 days. That's correct. Uh, the shuttle was originally designed for about 8 days. And then they changed the design. They 
added capabilities for the space shuttle to go up for up to two weeks. And this was the first mission of the called the extended orbiter kit that allow you to go up to about 15 days. And we were out there for 14. Actually, I think we'll have a picture. Well, here's, here's uh, uh, Gene in action. Well, as you can see, it's a ba basically wearing ordinary clothing there. And uh, everything is very comfortable. And the temperature is kept at a very comfortable, you know, 75 uh, to 80, 70 to 75 degrees. Uh, and then you can breathe uh, mm -hmm. very nicely. So it's, it's, it's like a short sleeve environment. And uh, it, uh, for a scientist working in a laboratory, that's about the best part. Yeah, I have to ask, this has really been um, sort of on my mind. Whenever I go into an airplane, there is a distinctive smell. Does a space shuttle have a distinctive smell that, that sticks in your memory? Well, it all depends when you start smelling. And the first day, it, it's got pretty much a smell of equipment, brand new stuff, you know, and, and metal and things like that. After 14 days, I hesitate to describe what the smell would be. It gets to smell like the people. <laughs> there are seven people for two weeks in a closed environment. You can tell that that might, uh, that actually, I really uh, admire the first folks who actually penetrate the space shuttle after a long a landing. Uh, it is quite, uh, it is quite punchy. Distinctive. Okay. All right. I, thank you for answering that. Thank you for answering it discreetly too. Uh, this, I believe, is also your mission. And uh, can you describe what we are seeing? Uh, this is, uh, un the, as you can, see, uh, you may know, uh, the space shuttle has. It's like uh, a truck transportation system. And inside, behind the, the flight deck and the mid deck, is a large area where you can actually carry things, you carry payloads. So in this case, we had the a space lab payload, which is a pressurized canister you had to put on the back porch there, and that's where all the scientific instruments are mounted, and this is where you work. And that's what you see there, that's the front part so of So this that. is a passageway going to the space lab, that's and this correct. is a space lab. That's correct. That's a tunnel. Uh, it goes from the front part of the habitable area. And all those, uh, uh, that space lab is pretty roomy. That's what makes it uh, very much more pleasant to be in for 14 days. Now, did they normally have the, the, the bay doors open, or was, were they usually closed? Uh, during launch and entry, they close. Uh, once you re reach orbit, they open the payload bay door. It also oh, okay. helps uh, heat uh -huh. rejection, it was cooling uh -huh. the system. There. Hmm. Do you happen to recognize where you are over in that picture? I can't remember where that oh, was. Okay. What is the background there? You mean the blue part? I can't tell what it is. The background. Oh. Oh, the black, well, what you see is uh, the space shuttle flying on orbit uh, with tail down to, to the, towards the Earth. So if you look out the window, you actually see the Earth. And the background, uh, is the blue part, is the ocean. And, some, oh. and you can see the outline of land. Yeah, it looks like there may be some peninsulas or, or islands somewhere there. And it looks like there's some cloud formations over here to the right. And yes, remember, uh, the Earth is composed of 70% ocean. So most of the time you will see blue or white. The whites are the clouds, and the blue is the ocean. Now actually I wonder if, you, can, you can't see it all on here, but who knows, maybe that's Australia. It, it, it could be, it's yeah. very hard to tell. It's hard to tell. <laughs> now here, here is a cutaway diagram of the um, space lab. That's, that's correct. You can see kind of a, a schematic of uh, the, the, the lab there. And most with of the, the bay history, doors open. With the bay doors open. Remember that the space shuttle was designed to really be a building capability for the International Space Station. So it had to have a payload bay where you could carry lots of instruments or a lot of structures that you can bring up to, uh, to, to in orbit in order to assemble. 
So it was used extensively, mostly to build the International Space Station, which is now on orbit 24 hours a day, and it's inhabited uh, full time. And I believe yours was the, your mission was the very first space lab mission, is that right? Uh, no, I no? believe it was uh, maybe the third or fourth, oh. but it was the first, uh, that's why the badges shows U.S. and no. <laughs> U.S. is United States Microgravity Lab. Microgravity, okay. So it was U.S. based uh, lab research. So these were all um, <coughs> experiments for um, mostly all uh, microgravity, how plants and things and people behave in microgravity. Yes, uh, uh, humans have been uh, inhabiting the Earth for a very long time and always in, in gravity. It's um, what they call it 1G. Now, every organism, plants, animals, people, uh, have evolved being in gravity. And if you wanted to go into space or you want to travel in space for a long time, there are certain effects that when gravity goes away affects the human body very negatively. So, in order to be able to go forward in the space exploration for a long time, you have to understand what those effects are. And they're very, very detrimental to human health. What were some of the... What, what, what was your main experiments there in microgravity? Can you describe them in, in layperson's terms? Okay, I'll try. Uh, as a scientist, I was, uh, I was specialized in, in a field really called physical acoustics. Acoustics is, in, uh, is a science of sound. So, of course, sound is uh, what you use to communicate most of the time. But on, on, uh, also, sound is used for various scientific purposes and also in terms of uh, weapons research too. But my area of physical acoustics use very high intensity sound in order to be able to levitate objects, levitate, lifting them off the ground uh, in 1G. Uh, so being able to do that allows you certain uh, ability to study materials or liquids or solids without touching them. And you can see that if you go into space and gravity is tremendously reduced, uh, then you can use those acoustic forces, acoustics, to be able to not levitate, because you don't need to levitate anymore. You can position things and manipulate things. My field was in fluid mechanics, and I was uh, looking at understanding the behavior of liquids in low gravity. Now, if you're on Earth and you pour water in a glass, of, in a glass you can see the water assumes a very flat surface. That's because gravity does that. Now, if you are in space, and you don't have gravity, and you release liquid, liquid will take the form of a sphere. That's because surface tension. So it has very interesting properties there. You can understand what happens when you look at free liquid in space and behavior of that. But also, it has uh, some uh, issues with safety. For example, if you have a water leak or some kind of nasty fluid leak in space in a spacecraft, a lot of time it will, it will not go into, it will not flow into something or fall down on the surface. It will kind of float around. And if you have uh, the bad uh, experience of hitting, uh, coming in contact with it, it will come into you and maybe get to your face and just blob around. And so it would create a hazard. Okay, uh, moving along this. This shows two things, one of which is the um, um, uh, space lab. And what is this on the left? Those are just uh, tanks. Uh, it, they carry uh, either hydrogen, oxygen, and, uh, and sometimes water. Okay? And they're just fuel tanks or uh, consumable. OK. But they are part of the uh, what we call it, extended uh, kit? They or, might be. They might be. I, yeah. I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, I, 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 because here, here is a um, 
a picture of them uh, lowering the, right. the uh, what do they call that, the kit, the, the, extended, the extended duration. Extended the, duration. Yes, yes. Uh, that's why they put it in the back of the space yeah. car. And this is extra, extra, extra uh, consumables. Yeah, extra. And all these done down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, mm -hmm. where they assemble all these parts together. Okay. Here you are, landing. And uh, you land, you, the, this was the first mission to land in Florida rather than at Edwards Air Force Base. And why was that? Uh, it may have been uh, one of the first missions, but I'm, 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 not, I'm not really sure. The, usually the space shuttle in the early days uh, lands at uh, Goldstone, up, up, uh, up north there, and then on the dry lake bed. They have a very large dry lake bed where it's easy to land and it's pretty flat. Uh, the problem with landing at Kennedy Space Center in those days is the runway was not long enough. The problem uh, on my flight was, uh, and we landed it in, on July, sometime in July, uh, it actually rained in the desert in July. It was pretty much very rare. But uh, when, when, when it rains, uh, a dry lake bed ain't dry anymore. <laughs> it becomes a lake. And of course, this is not a hydroplane, so we could not land the space shuttle there. So we had a, an additional day uh, going around several times and, uh, on orbit, and uh, we were asked to land at uh, Kennedy Space Center. Fortunately, we had uh, new tires and good brakes, and, and also a parachute. And a parachute. Uh, a, a slow parachute, so <laughs> it was it's not so bad. Is this the first shuttle flight where they deployed a parachute to Wow, you stop have those, uh, it's very specific right. questions. It may be. <laughs> I can't say for sure, but it probably was one of them. I got enough. I got enough information from Wikipedia just to know how to ask, but not answer. Okay. The, the, the thing also is that on a science mission with Space Lab, uh, the shuttle is pretty heavy. Uh, generally, when uh, they use a mission to build a space station, they leave stuff up on orbit. So when they come down, they're a lot lighter. But with a Space Lab on there. Uh, it, it is pretty heavy coming down, so you have that hmm. extra shoot to put down. Uh -huh. Now, this, I'm told, according to the caption, is a shot that was taken from the Columbia on that, on that mission of Mount Pinatubo in uh, the Philippines. Okay. And uh, a year earlier, it had erupted. And they say that it took several years for all of the dust and gas to um, to settle from that Mount Pinatubo eruption, and you can see that huge crater and the big lava and ash area around it. Uh, so this was a picture taken from that particular mission. Did you take it? No, I did not take. Did you take any pictures yourself? Oh, I, I took a lot of pictures. In the old, I remember in the days, uh, 1992, we didn't have uh, digital cameras. So we had to actually use films, and so we carried a lot of films, and mostly these pictures are used uh, with a hassle that 70 millimeters with big telephoto. Mm -hmm. So uh, even 150 to 200 miles up, uh, you can see things very clearly if you put that 400 millimeter, millimeter telephoto in front of your camera. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a picture that is kind of dear to your heart. Oh, this is great. Uh, this is actually uh, the shuttle. Column, uh, Endeavor coming down to, to LAX, and uh, no, Endeavor is down downtown at uh, Science uh, California Science Center. You can actually visit any day. Just you know, make an appointment ahead to find out when to do. So it uh, it was transported here uh, on the way to downtown, and and one of the best uh, trip that that uh, Endeavor took was from LAX to downtown. Uh, it was kind of a lot of fun, and a lot of people. We're on the way and looking at it, uh, going back down there. Actually, I happened to see it also. It was in Westchester in the parking lot, and I was driving down to Polvada and could see it uh, uh, through the buildings. And I think, I believe they're actually going to update the uh, this California Science Center and, and bring uh, and put it vertical. Oh, that would be very interesting. Yeah, it's always private donation. Now, this is another one of the badges from STS-50. 
Yes, generally, each of the uh, investigations, uh, scientific investigation on board, had the ability to pretty much uh, create their own batch in order to identify their, with their experiments in particular. This was a combustion experiment. Uh, that uh, it's, Combustion is an important factor uh, when gravity is removed. Uh, flames don't burn the same way, as you can see. Uh, there's no gravity, therefore there's no convection. The flames don't go up and the, the hot air doesn't rise. The hot air just stays where it is. Uh, so it, it creates a different type of combustion. And it's, it, it's a serious problem if you don't know these changes and something happens on water. Mm -hmm. And uh, microgravity laboratory, that's another one, showing the, the module. Well, the, the, the name microgravity is really saying that uh, it's one thousandth of, uh, of what, I, I mean, one millionth of what uh, the, uh, the level of gravity is. Because mostly gravity is reduced by a factor of 100 to 1,000. So if you weigh 100 pounds, it could be weighing one pound or one tenth of a pound. So you actually still do have some of the effects of gravity there. It's not absolutely zero gravity. No, what, what, how you achieve uh, near zero gravity is because the spacecraft goes around the Earth. And whenever you go into a circular path, you have what you call centrifugal acceleration. Mm -hmm. And the centrifugal acceleration, due to the going around in circle, uh, kind of counteract gravity. Mm -hmm. But you can never really counteract it completely. You can only counteract completely if you go way out in outer space, way uh, away from the Earth. Very interesting. This is another one from STS-50, I think. Uh, dynamics of drops and bubbles. Yes, this was another experiment that I was involved with. It, it, I think this particular badge... The yin was, and the yang. Yes, this particular badge was uh, uh, created at Vanderbilt University, where the, the principal investigator was. and uh, He was from Chinese descent, so he had this... Uh, Idea of doing yang and yang. So actually, on this mission, a lot of different types of experiments and scientific disciplines all came together where you were working together. That's correct. Uh, you know, things like uh, fluid physics, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, combustion science, uh, protein crystallization. A lot of medical research uh, went together. It's kind of put together as, a, as integrated payloads. And uh, the crew is trained to uh, take care of all of them, uh, essentially. Okay, and then this one is the famous portrait. Oh, which, well. <laughs> and I, I just don't look like that anymore. That's what I was Well, guess what? We all don't look like we looked in 1991 either. But the suit just <laughs> looks the same. And I can still fit you in it. You can still fit in it. All right, now, with that, uh, I'd like to ask for the lights to go on. Wake up! And uh, uh, perhaps if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, Jean, I, I tried to get some pictures that might stimulate your talking a little bit, and they did. So oh, okay. I'm happy about that. Well, but, uh, good job. Thank you. But uh, uh, any questions? How old were you? How old were you when you were... 41. Not now. You were 41 <clears throat> when you were... Huh? Yes, right now I'm actually 39. But... <laughs> no, 41. Now that's because of the Einstein theory of relativity, yeah, right? You go to high speed, you come back younger. Yeah. <laughs> but this is not very high speed. This, uh, the highest speed we go is 70,000 miles per hour. So. Remember, the speed of light is 671 million miles per hour. Although nobody goes faster than the speed of light. 17,000 miles per hour. What year did you uh, go in space? 1992. That's the year I retired. Did you blast off from uh, Cape Canaveral? Yes, yes, from uh, Cape, uh, Cape Canaveral, yes. And, uh, Columbia, was that, was that spaceship still around or was that 
No, unfortunately, the spaceship burned down on the later mission uh, on the way down. Uh, one of the two accidents that, that we incurred with the space shuttle program. And that was in 2003. Did you have children at the time? Yes, I had my daughter was one year old. Was she your oldest? I'm sorry? Was she your oldest? Yes, yes. And youngest. Yeah, and youngest. And that, that takes the other questions we had is the children feel that you're going into space. Were they, they fledged? No, they want to go with you. That's the problem. <laughs> well, now, what happened to Yvette? We need to have her tell us how she felt about your going into space. Well, she had a good time. I have a That's what. Yes, because I'm very curious. What did you glean in your field from this trip? Oh, well, I don't want to go into too many technical details, but a, a couple of the goals that we had was to verify the theoretical predictions of what the behavior was of a liquid sphere under rotation. So we have mathematical theories that predicts what happened. As, as, as you know, uh, the only way we understand the universe through science is through mathematics. Mathematics is the language of science. So you can use mathematics if you're very good and uh, you can uh, design theories to actually understand how the universe and the cosmos works. And this is a small field of fluid me mechanics where people actually create models using mathematics to predict how things behave. So we had the opportunity uh, to, un to look at the behavior of free liquids in, in space without touching it. And you cannot really do this on the ground on Earth, so by rotating it. And using acoustic forces, you can actually rotate the liquid, and you could observe the change in shape of the uh, of the, the rotating sphere as as you increase the velocity and compare it with theory. And and we were able to compare the theory and actually verify that it was true. And that's the way science works. Uh, a lot of times, to understand what happens, you have to think. <laughs> And good people and intelligent people come up with very good theories that explain how the universe works. Yvette, yeah. we, uh, we would like to know what you thought about him going into space. Well, <laughs> I would say uh, there's a lot of uh, excitement, the whole thing, you know. The fact that they invite us uh, there uh, three months in advance, then we we, are, we stay in uh, uh, space Johnson Space in uh, Houston, and uh, we I get to see the training a little bit, and uh, all the astronaut family get together, and we get a lot of support from our family. Everything it was the best time of my life. <laughs> we party a lot too. <laughs> and you had to manage a little tiny baby. Yeah, but I, it's not, well, I can't complain because it's not my, I'm the only one who has a baby. Because um, uh, the, I mean, the doctor there, she has two little kids too. Oh. And the other one, I'm so I can't complain. Everybody uh -huh. has baby, but it's, they, what happened is uh, uh, the astronaut from the uh, the one that just came back. Mm -hmm. they, they have a very help of the the family that flying. Mm -hmm. So they they they. they ah, really, so you had a support group. The yeah, families of support. the astronauts in the previous mission, mission were the one that supporting you all. That's that's very interesting. <laughs> Please, would you share? Uh, Two things: your uh, academic background and how the process of selection for you to get on on this crew. Yes, uh, I have to uh, preface that by saying I'm the luckiest guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I started out uh, uh, well. I, w I was raised in France, so I, I grew up there. I went to high school in France, and after graduating from high school. I applied for com coming to, to school, to university in the U.S. 
So my first two years, I, I went to a college, a liberal arts college in Ohio. And after that, I, I transitioned. I, I went to Columbia University in the engineering school. So I graduated with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, uh, applied physics. Then I went to graduate school and, at, at, at Yale University in New Haven. And I was there. That's where I, I started uh, getting into the field of physical acoustics. So I was under doing research. And it turns out that the research I was uh, doing for my thesis at the graduate, in the graduate school is, uh, was related to acoustic levitation. So, and that, that's very esoteric field, you know, this is one of those things that you can go out and get a job in industry right away, manufacturing semiconductors, you know. So, but the thing is, the reason why I was very lucky is that as I was looking for a job after graduating with a specialty in acoustic levitation, there is a program at the Jet Propulsion Lab, there was a program at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena that was just using acoustic levitation as a research tool for investigation in space. And that's, that was a natural thing. I went in there and I never left the, the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, for 20 years. So essentially, uh, because I was in, involved in this space investigation using acoustic levitation, and it was selected for flight uh, several times. And this, this was actually the second flight of the investigation, the one I was on. Uh, they usually, at NASA, when they have a scientific investigation, they want, of course, the, the, the best people are the one most knowledgeable for each investigation to actually carry out the investigation on orbit. So they had a program uh, using what they call payload specialist program that allow you to apply for flight to accompany your payload on your experiment in space. And they have selection committees to do that, and the selection committees are comprised of NASA officials and also a group of uh, investigators that are involved in the same flight. So you had to go there and apply and get selected to do that. So again, I was again lucky to get selected to go uh, on this particular flight. Uh, when you uh, blasted off, was there a, what do you call it, G's? Was there a certain amount of gravity pull going the other way and you're going... And did that affect, is, is that affect the physical uh, well-being of the uh, passengers? Yes, yes, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's it, up to a certain point. If you're a fighter pilot, and you fly those high-performance aircraft, uh, you, you can pull what they call very heavy loads up to five, six Gs. Generally, they do that for a few seconds at a time, so maybe 10, 20 seconds. And they're trained to do that. So essentially, what, what, when you're under high acceleration, five or six Gs, you really have to tense up to make sure that all your muscles are tensed up so in order to be able to keep the blood from pulling down your legs, you have to keep the blood up in your heart. The space shuttle, fortunately, has high acceleration, but the most was only three Gs. Uh, the, 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 it's three Gs, it's not bad. Uh, if you want to lift your arm, you would feel quite a bit of weight. Uh, like, instead of lifting your arm with nothing there, it's like you were lifting five, six pounds. So, it's, just, it, it's a little heavy, but it's not bad. Uh, it's 3G, but it lasts three to four minutes as opposed to a few seconds. So it, it's not really bad. It's just you don't want to do too many things. Uh, fortunately, also, even if you're the pilot or the commander, there are very few things that you actually do during launch. You flip a few switches, so you don't really have, have to move all that much. So it does affect you, uh, but it's only 3Gs. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know how long you would take 3Gs. I, I, I would... I would Imagine you could say stay under three G for an hour, maybe without having adverse effect. Well, when you get to the uh, what is it where you get high enough from Earth to there's still some Earth pull, but it's very, very, very slight. I mean, what keeps what keeps you from going keep going into space? Oh well, it's always still. 
uh, gravitational pull from the Earth. You know, at 200 miles, it's still so. But what happened is that you design your flight dynamics in order to actually up to go up to a certain orbit and then shut off the engine. So your thrust is not continuous. If you were going to the moon, it would be different. That's two different uh, flight dynamics. If you were going to the moon, you would fire your rockets a lot longer. In, in this case of the space shuttle to go into orbit at 200 miles altitude, you would cut off your engine at a certain point, and it would naturally, because of gravity, be pulled into a circular orbit. Well, that's cut off the engines, that, that uh, allows the uh, spacecraft to circle the globe? Exactly, exactly. It, that's where the balance, the escape velocity, and the balance. No propulsion, it's just... Well, there's still a little bit, because it does not... You, you cannot just stay forever on orbit without firing object, not firing the, the thrusters. You have to keep pushing it back up because gravity will slowly pull you back in. There's still residual there that's enough to keep pulling you back in. That's why satellites that we have in low Earth orbit have to have enough fuel to be kept on orbit all the time. If you have satellites that are high enough, 20,000 miles up, then it's mostly more, per, more or less permanent orbit. Yeah. Lower than that, you have to keep firing the thruster periodically to keep the altitude. One last question. Tom? Were you briefed on any medical situations and how to treat them, specifically if you were to bleed up there? Or? Uh, well, sp specific medical uh, response, not personally, no. Uh, but we had a medical response. Uh, medical doctor on board, and uh, we had, uh, like I said, we, we carried a bone saw. <laughs> a, a bone saw. Uh, generally, uh, yeah, medical doctor, and uh, generally the, the commander and the pilots have some uh, medical emergency kind of training, uh, but uh, we, we don't. Generally, nothing really happened except if it, you know, it's a, an accident or something like that. And uh, we were fortunate on space shuttle that nothing really like that happened. The only thing that one anticipates is being motion sick. You know, generally, uh, I think seventy percent of males can experience some form, some form of motion sickness due to the zero g. Women are a lot better for some reason. Only forty percent of them experience that. So there's net superiority of the feminine sex on that on that part. Uh, but. Uh, there is no really specific medical issue under normal circumstances. What medical issue arises is long duration. If you stay there for a long time, your bones start to get thin, uh, your muscles atrophy. That's why they have an exercise regimen to try to combat that. Uh, also, uh, like any change of environment, it's kind of detrimental on your constitution. You have to get used to everything. People have trouble sometimes with their back. Remember, when you have a back problem on, on Earth, it's aggravated because of gravity. Things tend to compress. You go into zero G, things don't compress, so it gets relieved. So in one instance, uh, after sitting for four hours waiting to launch you know, on your back, it kind of provides a little bit of a, of a stress. Uh, the first night I was up there, I felt a twinge on my back, and I hate that, because when I was on the ground, a twinge like that signals something pretty bad. But it went away after half an hour. There was no consequence. So things like that happen, little things that affect your physiology, but it's nothing special, if it's short duration. If you stay for six months, that's a different story. Well. Thank you very much, Jean. We have been at it for just about one hour. So time goes fast. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Thank you.